everyone. I'm going to make a new recording of the heart and cardiovascular function lecture um, because I wasn't real happy with how Blackboard Collaborate um, wasn't showcasing the PowerPoint for you. So anyway, this is a little bit of a redo uh, and hopefully you'll find it helpful. Okay, so first let's just start with an overview of the heart. It's got four chambers. The two top chambers are the atria and the two bottom chambers are the ventricles. The ventricles are gonna be the more muscular of the four chambers. Um, and essentially we have sort of two pumps going on because the right ventricle is going to pump deoxygenated blood out to the lungs and bring it back into the left atria and then the left ventricle is going to pump oxygenated blood out to the body the peripheral tissues and then it will come back via the vena cava into the right atrium so sort of two circuits going on there um, the heart can be found in the mediastinum um, which is one of the body cavities that you learned about in ANP1 lab uh, many moons ago. And we can see it here in this diagram, and you can see how the heart is behind the sternum, which acts um, to protect it. And then it uh, leans a little to the left, um, so we're going to see that it's sort of roughly between ribs 2 and 5 and extending a little beyond on each of those. Um, the heart is going to be enclosed by the pericardial cavity. Um, and the pericardium is um, a bit like a partially inflated balloon. There's a great image of this in your book on page 660. Um, and it really showcases how the heart kind of sits in this double layered um, pouch with uh, a space in between those two layers. And of course, the space is the actual cavity. Um, and then the layer closest to the heart would be like the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. And then on the far side of the space would be the parietal layer of the serous pericardium, which is also something you would have learned about in AMP1 lab back, back in the day. Um, any kind of inflammation of the pericardium would lead to pericarditis. Um, and that could be due to an infection, for example, of the pericardium. Um, but the diagnostic feature of it is that because of the inflammation, the surfaces are going to rub together. And so you'll hear sort of a scratching noise. Um, and it's actually um, detectable through a stethoscope. And one of the consequences of a pericarditis is that you could end up with a cardiac tamponade, um, which is when the movement of the heart is restricted because there's just not a lot of room um, inside this space. And so if there's fluid in the pericardial space that's or cavity, that's going to restrict the ability of the heart to expand and you know to relax and contract. And that's problematic in terms of heart function. Also, I just want to point out, because it's a little bit weird, the top of the heart is the base and the bottom of the heart is the apex. So sort of exactly the opposite of what you would expect. So, you know, anytime you have something like that, you, know, you always want to red flag that because it just screams test question. Okay, um, if we look at the wall of the heart, we can see that it has three layers. We're going to have the pericardium, the myocardium, which is going to be the bulk of it, and it's the muscle that's going to do the job of the heart. And then we're going to have the innermost lining, um, the endocardium. So if we start with that pericardium, which we've already been talking about, um, we can see we can split it into two big layers, a fibrous layer, which is going to be on the outside, um, and then the serous layer, which will be closer to the myocardium. And then that serous layer, as I already described, can be divided into the visceral and parietal layer. Remember, the visceral layer is the layer that's closest to the viscera or organ, and the parietal layer is the one that's on the far side of the cavity or space. Um, and then if we come in from there, we're going to have this nice, thick cardiac muscle. Um, here's a little micrograph to remind you of what you saw in ANP1 lab. And you identified cardiac muscle by the fact that it had these light striations and also these intercalated discs um, at their junctions. These are where gap junctions are located, which is one of the ways that cardiac cells are able to rapidly communicate with each other in order to create that synchronous squeezing beating of the heart, which we'll talk about um, in the future. 
And you can see that the cardiac muscle wall is pretty thick. Um, and these cells are going to need a tremendous amount of oxygen and glucose in order to keep up their ATP reserves so that they can, you know, contract their sarcomeres. Remember that from AMP1? So heart muscle is going to need its own blood supply, and we will talk about that as well. Um, and then on that very inner layer, we kind of have this like waterproofing layer, if you will, which is the endocardium. This is just a specialized, simple squamous epithelium. Um, and again, flashback to AMP1, it's got this nice underlying loose areolar or connective tissue because of course the endothelium is avascular like endothel uh, like epithelium is characteristically known for and so it's going to need a blood supply underneath it in order to nurture and take care of it okay then there are the external features of the heart i'm going to point these out but you know in the end you're going to have to spend some time memorizing the names and and learning how to recognize these features so where the vena cava um, enters in is the right atrium. And then if we drop down, that will bring us to the right ventricle. And then sort of circling over, we'll run into the left ventricle. And if we come up, we will end up in the left atrium. This is actually the oracle. If you see the little bumpiness, um, there's one here on the right. In theory, people think it looks like an ear and that like an ear flap. And that's how it got the name oracle. Um, and then we have these pipes up top. So as I mentioned, we have the vena cava here on the right. We have this very distinctive aortic arch with three branches coming off. And then we have the pulmonary trunk, um, which is sort of hiding um, the rest of the pulmonary vessels, which we'll see from the posterior side. And then you can also see there's this little ligament um, that attaches these two together. It's called the ligamentum arteriosum, and it just prevents this from moving too much as the heart is beating and blood is moving through. So from the back side of the heart, notice our left ventricle is now over here and our right ventricle is here. Our atria left and right are above. And then our pipes are gonna look quite different because before we saw the pulmonary um, artery trunk, here it is right here on the anterior side, now we're seeing it here. And underneath it on the back, we're gonna have that uh, pulmonary veins coming out of the left atrium. So you can see the pulmonary veins. There's two pairs of them that are leaving the left atrium. So um, it's, it's a bit of a distinct characteristic and recognizable. And then you can see that aortic arch, again, coming up over the pulmonary trunk or artery. Um, and now from the back, we can also see that inferior vena cava, which is dumping into the right atrium. Um, so those are the major features. Okay, now the heart, as I mentioned, is a muscle itself and it needs its own blood supply. And so it is going to get its blood supply from the left and right coronary arteries, which if you look at this view of the heart where we have removed the pulmonary trunk so we can see the bottom of the aortic arch, and lo and behold, here are the right and left coronary arteries and we can see them branching out the right coronary artery is gonna give rise to the marginal arteries that run along the margin of the heart. And the left coronary artery is gonna give rise to the circumflex and the anterior interventricular. And so that will send out blood to the entirety of the heart muscle. They will only fill when the ventricles are relaxed because when the ventricles are contracting, it compresses the arteries and blood isn't able to flow through them. Any blockage of these arteries would prevent oxygen from reaching the heart muscle cells that need it, and then that could lead to ischemia or potentially cardiac arrest. Um, so that's not a good thing. And the higher up the blockage, like the closer to the aortic arch it is, then the more muscle would be robbed of that blood. The further down um, the branches of these coronary arteries, then the smaller the area of the heart that would be impacted. And then the other big structure we have um, is the coronary sinus, which we can see up here. This is a large vein that is going to empty directly into the right atrium. So it's draining the heart um, and dumping that blood into the right atrium, which will eventually flow into the right ventricle and head out to the lungs in order to pick up oxygen. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, any blockage of the coronary arteries could be problematic. So any thickening or hardening of artery walls is known as arterior, uh, arteriosclerosis. 
Uh, it's hard to talk with a very stuffy nose and a sore throat. Um, and so we have two major types of arteriosclerosis. We have atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease. Um, both of them can lead to blockages of the heart arteries or any artery really. But atherosclerosis is the most common one and it's caused by lipid deposits, also known as plaques that build up in the arteries and reduce flow um, and eventually could block the artery in its entirety. The risk factors are gonna include high cholesterol. Um, anything over 200 is concerning and young people should be significantly under that. Um, your cholesterol will rise naturally as you get older. So you wanna start low so you have some room to expand. You know, you wanna eat a good diet, lots of fiber, lots of plant-based foods, exercise, you know, all that good stuff to keep your cholesterol in check. Anyone with high blood pressure, anyone who smokes, um, and then older males. All of these increase your risk factor for developing atherosclerosis. And some of the consequences of atherosclerosis can be heart attack and stroke. Um, remember, a heart attack is any time that the muscle cells of the heart are not able to function as a result of loss of blood and the resulting loss of oxygen and glucose. Strokes are when there's a blockage or a tear in an artery that prevents blood from traveling past the site of the injury. And so again, cells are going without the blood supply that they need. One thing that we can do if somebody has a partial blockage is we could do a balloon angioplasty. This is where we thread a thin wire with a little balloon that we inflate once we get it to the location and it will compress the plaque up against the vessel wall in order to create an opening that blood can then flow through. Um, this is typically a better option than the older method, which was to cut out the damaged area of the vessel and replace it with a piece of vein, like the femoral vein. Now, this can be done, and in some cases it, it has to be done. Um, there are situations where an angioplasty isn't going to work for that particular patient. But this is obviously more complex. There's greater likelihood of complications and potential negative outcomes as well for the patient. The other type um, of arteriosclerosis is coronary artery, artery disease. This is any blockage of the heart arteries. It can lead to coronary ischemia, which is when there's a loss of oxygen or not enough oxygen and some of the cells may die and that in turn can lead to cardiac arrest. One thing um, that we can do here um, and in this situation up here with the balloon angioplasty as well is that if we're concerned that the vessel isn't gonna remain open after the angioplasty, they can place a stent, which is kind of like a little mesh tube um, that gets expanded once it's in location and it just maintains the patency, that should be an A right there, the patency of the vessel so that blood is able to flow through. Okay, <clears throat> that brings us to the internal anatomy of the heart. So again, this is one of those things where you just have to spend time memorizing it, but let me walk you through it one time. Here is our superior vena cava. These blue arrows indicate deoxygenated blood. There's the inferior. So blood from the head and blood from the lower part of the body are gonna return to the heart via the vena cava. It's deoxygenated because the cells have already extracted the oxygen um, and this blood is gonna have CO2 in it. It's going to enter the right ventricle, excuse me, the right atrium. It's gonna enter the right atrium. And then it will pass through a valve called the AV valve, also known as the tricuspid valve. It will pass through into the right ventricle. And from the right ventricle, this deoxygenated blood will then travel out the pulmonary trunk through the pulmonary valve, also known as the semilunar valve. And from there, once it passes through that valve, it'll travel through the arteries, the pulmonary arteries, even though this is deoxygenated blood, it's in an artery and it's gonna go to the lungs where it will be reoxygenated. And then that oxygenated blood is going to come back via the pulmonary vein. So these are veins, but they're carrying oxygenated blood. And we can see that with these little red arrows here. So the Left atria will receive oxygenated blood from the lungs via the pulmonary veins. That blood will then need to pass through the left AV valve, also called bicuspid, also called mitral. You know what's really hard for students? When there's multiple names for things. So be aware, because that could really trip you up. I try to just say 
AV or bicuspid, but that mitral valve pops out in questions and things like that. So once that oxygenated blood is in the left ventricle, when the left ventricle, notice how muscular it is, it can produce a strong contraction and it's going to force that blood up into the aorta through the aortic valve, which is also a semi-lunar valve, just like the one on the pulmonary trunk. So out the blood goes into the aortic arch and out to all of the body. Um, so that's the flow of blood through the heart that you need to know. And while we're here, I'll just point out, if you look at these valves, take note that there are the actual cusps of the valves. These are these white sheet-like things. And then there are these strings, which are called the chordae tendinae, and then they are attached to the papillary muscles, which can contract. So between the blood pushing back to help close the valves, and then the chordae tendinae and the papillary muscle pulling, it'll keep the valves from swinging back through into the atria. So they just play an important role in how valves function and any damage to these could result in the valve not functioning properly. Hey, here's a little HESI test practice question for anyone that has that coming up in their future. Which of the following transports oxygenated blood to the heart from the lungs? Think about it for a second. And the answer is the pulmonary veins. Veins always bring blood to the heart. Arteries always take it away from the heart. It doesn't matter whether it's oxygenated or deoxygenated. It has to do with whether the blood is moving away or towards the heart. Arteries away, veins towards. So as I mentioned, there are things that you need to know. You want to know the right atrium collects deoxygenated blood. Um, you want to know there's a tricuspid valve from the right to the right atrium to the right ventricle. Um, you want to know about the semilunar valve in the pulmonary trunk. You want to know the left atria receives oxygenated blood from the pulmonary veins, that we've got a mitral or bicuspid or AV valve between the left atria and the left ventricle, and that that oxygenated blood is going to go through a semilunar valve into the aorta in order to move out through the whole body. So that's just a repeat of what I said on this slide. Okay. Um, and also just coming back around to valve functions, they do control the flow of blood and prevent blood from uh, moving backwards. We don't want that. That's called regurgitation. So the AV valves, the ones between the atria and the ventricle, will permit blood to flow from the atria into the ventricles when the ventricles are relaxed because that's when the chordae tendinae are going to be loose. But once the ventricles contract, the blood will force the valves closed and then the papillary muscles will tense so that the valves don't swing into the atria and that will close that. If there's any issues here, we'll get regurgitation and if it's just a little bit, it could be a murmur, but if it's a lot, it could be a real problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, also important to note, there is a cardiac skeleton and that's kind of like the door frame um, for valves. So in the same way that a door frame has that little bit of overlap that keeps the door from swinging all the way through, the cardiac skeleton does that as well. We've got the semilunar valves are actually more stable than the AV valves just due to their design and shape. Now we don't need to get into the physiology of that, but it's just important to know you're more likely to have an issue with an AV valve than you are with a semilunar valve. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, damaged valves can compromise cardiac function if blood isn't moving through appropriately. So you have some pictures in your book that you can look at to understand the valves and what they look like <coughs> and how they um, you have that cardiac skeleton um, around them to give them some shape and structure so that they can open and close. And then I've also provided you, um, this is in your textbook, so but you can practice labeling these structures. Um, and I even, oh, pop the answers in for you so you can check your answers. So this is a great way to see if you've got this stuff memorized. Um, and I'm guessing it will help for lab as well because chances are you have to know it there too. All right, hope this helps.